So we have Professor Roberto Capello from uh, the Politecnico di Milan uh, with us, who is one of uh, Europe's foremost regional economists. And she was a keynote speaker at our membership seminar uh, yesterday. So uh, I wanted to ask you first about, uh, you talked about growth strategies for Europe and uh, you had a design to look forward to the year 2030, uh, making some proposals in which direction industrial and regional structures in Europe should develop. Could you explain a bit the scenarios you were describing? Thank you, yes. The idea is uh, to build some scenarios in order to understand the effects that these scenarios can uh, develop in Europe. And uh, the outcome of the exercise uh, was to find out that uh, the scenario where both blocks of countries regain competitiveness in terms of industrial uh, development uh, is the one the most expansionary and the one that provides uh, not only the highest growth rate in the future, but also the less um, increase in divergence uh, among countries. And this is something that has to be strengthened. Uh, this is an important result in the sense that the, at, the crisis stopped the convergence trends among European countries uh, for two reasons. The Eastern countries stopped their let's say, high growth rate trends that they had before the crisis. But also the southern countries uh, suffered, as we all know, a lot from the crisis. As this, and this created really, a, a, let's say, a, a reverse in the convergence trends that we had over the last 10 to 12, 20 years. And this holds also at the regional level, even if the DG Regio in the European Union doesn't want to listen to that, but this is the reality. And there are some, not only some forecasts, but also mm -hmm. some uh, past trends that tell us that uh, this convergence trend has uh, stopped. Um, and the, the possibilities, the, the scenarios that we built all show that we will go towards a divergence. The point is uh, not if, the, sorry, the, 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 our industrial scenario show that this is the situation where uh, the, the divergence will increase uh, less than the, in the other scenarios. And again, the result comes from the fact that in the industrial scenario, the eastern countries will grow less than the, in the past and they will grow as much as the Western countries, or a little bit more, but this means that the convergence trends will, uh, will uh, the, the, the level of uh, GDP, uh, per capita GDP, will, will appear in a very, very long term, or even keep, are kept um, different for the time being. Uh, and the Southern Europe will also suffer a little bit because they of course are not the, 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 the countries where the strongest and uh, high level and uh, quality level uh, production activities can take place, at least at the moment. This is the industrial, uh, the industrial strategy scenario. scenario yeah. uh, yes. So you, uh, the way you described it is there were two aims uh, which one wanted to achieve. One, an overall higher growth rate for the European yeah. economy, but at the same time pe keeping track on inter-country divergence, but also inter-regional divergence exactly. of income levels and growth performances. And uh, so you, uh, the outcome of this analysis was uh, there is an argument to be made for uh, more pushing towards industry, uh, higher value industry uh, in uh, the Western European countries, let's say the core economies, the richer economies of Europe, not forgetting that besides an orientation towards high value services, there should be a base of industrial development. Yeah, exactly. And for the south or, and the east, um, there is an, um, uh, an attempt to move away from purely uh, an absorption of technology through foreign direct investment and trying to push towards some innate uh, innovation capacity exactly. uh, as well. Now, tell, me, uh, tell us a little bit about the policy instruments which one could use to steer the economies in these different parts of Europe. In fact, you also mentioned Southern Europe and not only the two blocks, that one of the blocks is there. 
which could be used to steer uh, these different groups of economies in the direction which you say is favorable for overall growth and for uh, a better convergence story. Good. Well, of course, uh, industrial policy cannot be separated from innovation policies, which is very, very important if we speak about high quality uh, goods and high quality uh, production. So this means that innovation policies have to be uh, carefully uh, adjusted to uh, help this kind of industrial development. Uh, in this field, there is a huge debate at the regional level, but this, this is also part of the, of the national uh, uh, strategy, strategies. Uh, so there is a huge debate at the European level on how to develop uh, future innovation policies at the regional and national level. And uh, probably you are familiar with this debate on the smart specialization strategy, mm -hmm. which has been put uh, in place uh, with the new uh, structural fund uh, peer programming period. And um, the idea there is that you have, let's say, to uh, adjust uh, for each region its uh, uh, innovation policy according to its uh, specialization. And this is why it's called SMART. SMART means something that is, let's say, uh, that looks uh, uh, for uh, bright um, reactions and bright uh, policy uh, intervention uh, in, uh, in, in some uh, local economies where um, uh, these normative interventions fit with what is already there. Uh, we agree, of course, with this uh, strategy, even if uh, this strategy has moved from uh, a, let's say a, 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 from one the first idea of the smart specialization was that these strategies have to be uh, tailored uh, for the center of uh, Europe and for the periphery, where center and periphery were not geographically uh, meaning, but in terms of innovation capacity. Uh, so they were claiming R&D uh, funds have to be given to the strong areas uh, where R&D is already there, while to the rest of, uh, of, the, of the regions we, you should uh, be given uh, funds for applying uh, mm -hmm. helping in applying and in uh, doing new applications for, of the, of the R&D uh, results. So one was more on the R and the periphery was mm -hmm. more on the D, on the development uh, of, of innovation. Um, this, is, this turned out quickly to be too much uh, a, a, a simplified uh, division. And the, the, in the second phase, the smart specialization strategy went into the opposite uh, situation, saying each region should, provide, should be provided with its own strategy. Uh, well, this is, again, according from, to mm -hmm. our idea, a, an exaggeration. Uh, in the sense that this would mean if we go for the NUTS 2, which are the administrative unit levels where the funds uh, are, 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 uh, allocated. are allocated, we have 268 regional strategies. Mm -hmm. That's something that is absolutely impossible even to be coordinated mm -hmm. uh, at the European level uh, so that you, you, you avoid, you have to control 268 strategies and uh, not only to control but to evaluate. Mm -hmm. uh, so our idea stays a little bit in between and this is what we developed with the project that we showed that regions have different modes of innovation, different ways in which they innovate. I'll give you an example. There are some regions that are the core regions where you have knowledge creation and the context conditions to create knowledge. Then you have the context conditions there to translate knowledge into innovation. Uh, and then uh, you, you mm -hmm. hopefully you grow, of course. You expect a, a, an outcome from that. And this is a way of innovating. You have everything inside, then you, you can say be linked to other strong areas, but in any case you are in a self-sustained uh, situation. There are some other regions that have a completely different way of innovating because they have uh, a very high product innovation performance, but they miss and they lack the preconditions to create their own knowledge. And the product innovation uh, comes from the fact that they are bright enough, they have a lot of entrepreneurship, 
capacities to go and look for the knowledge that they need outside the region. Uh, this is typical of our, uh, in Italy, the third Italy uh, area, so all the local industrial districts where we have a very high product innovation level, but no R&D uh, cap capabilities. And this is due to the fact that we look outside for other uh, knowledge. And this is an, the third case, let's say stylized way of analyzing, of innovating, is the fact that you can imitate an innovation which is outside and you can bring it into your region and adjust it to your needs. So these are, let's say, the theoretical uh, archetypes of modes of innovation. Then we measured them in terms of empirical analysis and we found out that these exist in Europe and they are a little bit more, let's say, elaborated because it, the reality is always a little bit more complex than the, the stylized uh, uh, theory. Uh, but we, uh, our idea is that the regional innovation policies should at least the strategies, the general strategies should be calibrated on the innovation modes that each region has. Uh, and then, of course, the project, the projects themselves, they can come from the regions, but within a strategy which is common to the regions that belong to a type of to an innovation mode. Uh, and this means that you have to avoid uh, to develop R&D activities in uh, Sicily or in uh, Sardinia because this is something that we did in the past mm -hmm. and this is not because they uh, don't need uh, innovation but this is because they, their mode of innovation is not based on R&D activities. Mm -hmm. So you, you throw away your money if you, if you do not uh, look the, at the way in which regions innovate. So that's, uh, the, mm -hmm. I think, the way. So in fact, uh, what you're describing is that one has gone a long way or in the development of what used to be called cohesion policies, where these uh, production and productivity enhancing aspects were not that much emphasized. It was much more uh, trying to uh, achieve uh, better income uh, inequality, while the, uh, the developments have gone much more into productivity enhancement and behind that a very differentiated picture of what innovation really means and how to translate innovation policy. Now, uh, coming back to the issue of smart specialization, there seems to be a tension which you described between an attempt to build something bottom-up, meaning that an innovation policy should be well grounded in the conditions in particular regions, in the interaction between, uh, well, some people call it innovation systems, uh, the type of uh, institutions uh, which can generate uh, innovation or adapt innovation, the business community, the local authorities and so on, and there should be a bottom-up process of defining it. At the same time, you pointed out that, well, specialization per se means that it's relative to other regions and relative to, uh, to evolving regional industrial structures in neighboring regions, in the country as a whole, in cross-border regions, etc. And there is this challenge of uh, finding a coordination device. Yeah? So what sort of coordination is envisaged in the current evolution of regional policy making and industrial policy making in Europe? Um. We, uh, I think that the coordination has to come at different levels. Uh, first of all, of course, the European level that has to, let's say, coordinate the different uh, suggestions and the different strategies that come from different regions. But uh, the problem there, and it's already been uh, faced, uh, this, this problem has already been envisaged, that there are many um, uh, applications, so there are many um, uh, the applications and then uh, also the fact that regions, mm -hmm. uh, for regions it's very difficult to find their, uh, their specialization. So it's m not because they, uh, they don't know what, uh, let's say, what they are able to do, but because they might have different strong actors that are, for example, in different sectors uh, and they push uh, to have uh, a specialization pattern with which is which belongs to, to their sects, to their industry. So there I think the national governance have to play a role and this is why um, even if the smart specialization strategy is being developed for, for regions, uh, so it's a regional uh, policy, uh, the European Union uh, 
has asked for national smart specialization policies. And this is uh, not because they want to know the specialization at the national level, but because the national documents have to coordinate uh, the, the, the cross bottom up, uh, the cross countries. The cross countries. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's extremely important. And this could also be a way to keep local lobbies uh, under control, because this is another point that the European Union is very much aware of, that this mass specialization strategy has, since, as you said, these are policies that are bottom-up policies, uh, you give a lot of, you, you risk to give a lot of power to local lobbies. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, local lobbies sometimes do not act <laughs> for the benefit of the region. Uh, so you, you, you really have to, to check, and this, is, this has to be done even at the project level. So when the projects come in, uh, you have to see uh, which are the actors involved, why, and if this fits uh, with the, the regional uh, strategy. But uh, again, the regional strategy could be, let's be, being forced into this kind of uh, uh, specialization if this fits with the national strategy. Mm -hmm. And in Italy we have found out already that there are, uh, let's say, regions that claim to be specialized in areas where, let's say, at least uh, uh, people that live in Italy would have never expected them to be specialized in, at least experts, not mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. in the street, but mm -hmm. experts would have never thought mm -hmm. of uh, having specialization. Like that. So this is a kind of, coordi the coordination of all these mass specialization strategies is extremely complex, and we are now uh, running um, the first, uh, I think it's the first year or mm -hmm. even something like a year and a half and there are already some uh, ongoing um, uh, examples or uh, evaluations, evaluations mm -hmm. and we, we, we will find out uh, and these problems are, are, arise uh, mm -hmm. and so there will be some, uh, let's say, adjustments to the strategy. In fact, you alluded now to a problem which uh, all the forms of industrial policy were always accused of, mm. that they were always geared towards the incumbents, uh, the firms which are already having a strong market position. And you said that that danger also exists uh, with the smart specialization policy, not only from the business community side, but even from the relation between the business community and the local authorities. Yeah. And do you feel that there is something put into place to counter that bias towards incumbents in the current uh, At present I don't think they, that there is nothing specific to avoid that. The, 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 what they, the, I think both the European Union and the national governments are aware of that and so the, 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 the coordination as they call them is really to, to try to avoid that the incumbents, let's say, uh, are the ones that win, uh, just by definition because they are there. Uh, and this is something that uh, has been criticized a lot in the smart specialization strategies that given the fact that this is an innovation policy strategy, the fact that you push um, innovation uh, to be, let's say, financed only by a, in the areas that are already there, it's something that goes against, this has been told, against the concept of innovation. Innovation can be a disrupted uh, element mm -hmm. in, in, a, in mm -hmm. an economy. Mm -hmm. So it could be that a region that is specialized in agriculture uh, finds out that, that there is a bright mm -hmm. person that invents something and makes the uh, the region go out so a bigger of its, jump, uh, a out bigger of the jump. So the yeah. ra mm -hmm. radical jumps. Mm -hmm. So the, the change in the technological paradigms have been seen as very difficult in mm -hmm. a smart specialization strategy mm -hmm. because the mass specialization strategy, let's say, blocks mm -hmm. or tries to, to builds on existing, builds on existing. So yeah. it yeah. Some, in a sense avoids uh, and prevents these big jumps to take place. Thank you, Roberta, for Thank a lot you. of interesting insights okay. into regional and innovation policy. Thank you.